The Kingdom of Benin, nestled in the lush southern forests of West Africa, thrived from the 13th to the 19th century. Governed by the Edo people, its capital, aptly named Benin, served as the epicenter of a trade web meticulously overseen by the king, or Oba. This network included interactions with Portuguese traders who sought riches in the form of gold and slaves. However, as with many great kingdoms, Benin faced its challenges and eventually succumbed to British conquest in 1897. Today, it is remembered for its exquisite brass sculptures and plaques, portraying rulers and their families, recognized as some of Africa's finest artworks. In the journey to understand Benin's origins, we trace the roots back to the Nok culture and the kingdom of Eif. The region embraced ironworking technology from the 9th century, enhancing agriculture and fostering settlement growth. Ife, flourishing between the 11th and 15th centuries, was renowned for its cast bronzes, especially expressive human head sculptures. Benin's oral traditions suggest a significant link between the two kingdoms, with a master craftsman from Ife influencing Benin's art scene in the late 13th century. Prince Oren Mian's invitation and his son Yuka's reign marked the foundation of Benin. While myths and traditions often point to Ife as the birthplace of kingship and brass casting in Benin, archaeological evidence has yet to solidify the connection between these dominant West African states. Geographically situated near the southern coast, the Kingdom of Benin comprised a diverse landscape of rainforest, dry forest, and mangrove swamp. Established as a state in the 13th century, the kingdom's zenith covered an impressive area, with the heartland surrounding the capital directly governed by the king, an outer ring led by royal princes, and a third circle of tribute-paying tribes not directly under the king's rule. The Kingdom of Benin prospered through regional trade, acting as a vital middle trader between neighboring kingdoms. As the Kingdom of Benin thrived, its prosperity was intricately woven into the fabric of regional trade. Acting as a crucial middle trader between neighboring kingdoms, Benin facilitated the exchange of goods it did not produce, such as cotton and semi-precious stone beads. This bustling trade network extended beyond Benin, connecting West African peoples in a web of commerce that involved items ranging from fish, salt, yams, to cattle. Such well-established trade relations even saw the use of native currencies, represented by manilas, heavy horseshoe-shaped bracelets, wiring, rods, and cowrie shells, the latter sourced from distant lands like Persia and the Maldives. The dynamics of Benin's trade evolved with the arrival of Portuguese ships along the Atlantic coast of Africa from around 1450. These ships offered an alternative to the traditional trans-Saharan caravan routes, disrupting the established trade networks. The Portuguese, in their quest for wealth, reached the Gold Coast in the south of West Africa from 1471. Despite Benin not being a coastal state, it maintained essential contacts through the port of Ugoton on the Benin River. Engaging with the Portuguese, Benin established a trading relationship that spanned 30 years from 1487. The Europeans coveted beads, cotton cloth, ivory, and slaves, which they in turn traded with other West African peoples for the prized commodities of gold and pepper, highly sought after in Europe. Meanwhile, West African tribes eagerly sought Indian cotton cloth, glass beads, and cowrie shells brought by the Portuguese. The King of Benin wielded strict control over the kingdom's trade, establishing a royal monopoly. This strategic position allowed negotiations with the Portuguese, who, faced with the king's authority, were even prohibited from selling male slaves after 1516, as the king reserved them for his own army. In 1514, the king initiated diplomatic relations with the Portuguese government, seeking firearms for his kingdom. However, the Portuguese, hesitant to arm a potential adversary, sent Christian missionaries instead, aiming to convert the ruler and his people to Christianity. Despite the building of churches and some conversions, the attempts at spreading Christianity were overshadowed by the true motive, the Portuguese policy of extracting the land's valuables quickly and cheaply. The 19th century would witness a more concerted effort by European missionaries to challenge indigenous beliefs in West Africa. In the Kingdom of Benin, the title of Oba was not just a mere designation, it carried divine significance, symbolizing the ruler's inherent right to govern. The Oba held a tight grip on external trade, personally owning valuable goods like leopard skins, pepper, coral, and ivory. The king's authority was immortalized in Benin art, where ivory masks, worn at the hip, depicted rulers adorned with crowns and necklaces of human heads, possibly representing Europeans and signifying the Oba's trade monopoly or dominance over foreigners. Benin kings often featured in brass plaques that adorned the palace, 
portraying them as warrior leaders identifiable by symbols such as leopard spot scarification marks and leopard tooth necklaces. The leopard, considered the king of the bush, was a fitting symbol for the Oba, and only the king had the privilege of hunting one, an act performed annually in a sacrifice for his honor. Other royal symbols included a coral embellished helmet and white mask ornaments around their waists, representing purity and Olokun, the god of the sea and source of wealth and fertility. Yu Wer the Great, a renowned king of Benin, left an indelible mark on its history. Not only a formidable warrior, Yu Wer ushered in a period of prosperity and expanded the kingdom to its zenith. However, his reign was marred by the establishment of the Oba as an absolute monarch and the alleged murder of his brother. Yu Wer's governance structure, characterized by hereditary and appointed chiefs, persisted throughout the kingdom's existence. Additionally, he initiated the convention that a king's eldest son would inherit the throne, solidifying the hereditary nature of Benin's rulership. Visiting Benin in 1553, English naval officer Thomas Wyndham provided a glimpse into the court's atmosphere, describing the king surrounded by nobles in a vast hall, cowering until the king commanded them. The city of Benin, located about 30 kilometers from the coast and west of the Niger River, revealed an intricate social structure. Surrounded by high earthworks, the city served as both the political and spiritual heart of the kingdom. The palace, with its courtyards and galleries adorned with brass plaques, stood as a testament to Benin's rich cultural heritage. Benin's artistic legacy, particularly its brass sculptures, gained international acclaim. The arrival of Portuguese ships in the late 15th century sparked a boom in brass production. The lost wax technique, employed from this period, gave rise to iconic plaques depicting warriors, rulers, historical conflicts, court life, and religious rituals. Ivory, another favored medium, manifested in hip masks, boxes, combs, and armlets. Benin artists showcased their skill in crafting life-size brass sculptures, ceremonial bells, and intricate ivory salt cellars with a uniquely African twist. However, the kingdom's decline began in the late 19th century. European powers, including the British, sought to loosen Benin's control on trade. In 1897, Britain conquered the weakened kingdom after prolonged dynastic disputes and civil wars. While the kings were not entirely displaced, Benin's royal descendants still hold the title of Oba, serving in an advisory role to the Nigerian government. The legacy of Benin endures, with the name revived by the Republic of Benin, formerly Dahomey, when it gained independence in 1975. Despite the conquest by the British in 1897, the lineage of Benin's kings persisted. The descendants of the once mighty Oba retained the title and continued to play a role in advising the Nigerian government. While the political landscape had transformed, the cultural and historical significance of the kingdom endured. The British, driven by imperial ambitions and a desire to control trade, had dismantled the traditional power structures of Benin. Yet, the resilience of Benin's people and their cultural heritage was not so easily extinguished. The kingdom's influence lingered in the hearts of its descendants and in the remnants of its once glorious capital. As the 20th century unfolded, Nigeria emerged from the shadows of colonial rule. In 1960, the country gained independence, and a new chapter began. The Republic of Benin, formerly Dahomey, chose to honor the legacy of the ancient kingdom by adopting its name. This act reflected the recognition of the Kingdom of Benin's historical importance and cultural richness. The city of Benin, with its intricate earthworks and traces of a bygone era, became a site of archaeological fascination. Excavations unearthed the foundations of a once thriving capital, providing valuable insights into the kingdom's urban planning, social organization, and artistic achievements. The brass plaques, ivory sculptures, and cultural artifacts discovered in these digs spoke eloquently of Benin's grandeur. The story of the Kingdom of Benin, a tale that spans centuries, did not conclude with the British conquest. Instead, it transformed into a narrative of resilience, cultural preservation, and a rekindling of heritage. The descendants of the Oba, while no longer ruling a sovereign kingdom, became custodians of a legacy that transcended time. Today, the Republic of Benin stands as a testament to the enduring spirit of a people who once thrived in the heart of West Africa.